Good morning, friends. We are on Chapter 6, The Wild Wastelands of the North. At about nine o'clock next morning, three lonely figures might have been seen picking their way across the shrivel by the shoals and stepping stones. It was a shallow, noisy stream, and even Jill was not wet above her knees when they reached the northern bank. About fifty yards ahead, the land rose up to the beginning of the moor, everywhere steeply and often in cliffs. I suppose that's our way, said Scrub, pointing left and west to where a stream flowed down from the moor through a shallow gorge. But the Marsh Wiggle shook his head. The giants mainly, mainly live along the side of that gorge, he said. You might say the gorge was like a street to them. We do, we'd do better straight ahead, even though it's a bit steep. They found a place where they could scramble up, and in about ten minutes stood panting at the top. They cast a longing look back at the valley land of Narnia, and then turned their faces to the north. The vast, lonely moor stretched on and up as far as they could see. On their left was rockier ground. Jill thought that must be the edge of the giant's gorge, and did not much care about looking in that direction. They set out. It was good, springy ground for walking, in a day of pale winter sunlight. As they got deeper into the moor, the, lonely, the loneliness increased. One could hear pewits and see an occasional hawk. When they halted in the middle of the morning for a rest and a drink in a little hollow by the stream, Jill was beginning to feel that she might enjoy adventures after all, and said so. We haven't had any yet, said the Marsh Wiggle. Walks after the first halt, like school mornings after break or railway journeys after changing trains, never go on as they were before. When they set out again, Jill noticed that the rocky edge of the gorge had drawn nearer, and the rocks were less flat, more upright than they had been. In fact, they were like little towers of rock, and what funny shapes they were. I do believe, thought Jill, that, that all the stories about giants might have come from those funny rocks. If you were coming along here when it was half dark, you could easily think those piles of rock were giants. Look at that one now. You could almost imagine that the lump on top was a head. It would be rather too big for the body, but it would do well enough for an ugly giant. And all that bushy stuff, I suppose it's heather and bird's nest, really do quite well for hair and beard. And the things sticking out on each side are quite like ears. They'd be horribly big, and then, but then I dare say giants would have big ears like elephants, and oh! Her blood froze. The thing moved. It was a real giant. There was no mistaking it. And she had seen its head turn. She had caught a glimpse of the great, stupid, puff-cheeked face. All the things were giants, not rocks. There were forty or fifty of them, all in a row, obviously standing with their feet on the bottom of the gorge, and their elbows resting on the edge of the gorge, just as men might stand leaning on a wall. Lazy men on a fine morning after breakfast. Keep straight on, whispered Puddleglum, who had noticed them, too. Don't look at them, and whatever you do, don't run. They'd be after us in a minute. So they kept on, pretending not to see, not to have seen the giants. It was like walking past the gate of a house where there was a fierce dog, only far worse. There were dozens and dozens of these giants, and they didn't look angry or kind or interested at all. There was no sign that they had seen the travelers. Then, whiz, 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 some heavy object came hurtling through the air, and with a crash a big boulder fell about twenty paces ahead of them, and then, thud, another fell twenty feet behind. Are they aiming at us? asked Scrub. No, said Puddleglum. We'd be a good deal safer if they were. They're trying to hit that, that cairn over there on the right. They won't hit it, you know. It's safe enough. They're such, a, they're such very bad shots. They play cockshies most fine mornings, about the only game they're clever enough to understand. It was a horrible time. There seemed no end to the line of giants, and they never ceased hurling stones, some of which fell extremely close. Quite apart from the real danger, the very sight and sound of their faces and voices were enough to scare anyone. Jill tried not to look at them. After about twenty-five minutes, the giants apparently had a quarrel. This put an end to the cockshies, but it is not... It is not pleasant to be within a mile of quarreling giants. They stormed and jeered at one another in long, meaningless words, about twenty syllables each. They foamed and gibbered and jumped in their rage, and each jump shook the earth like a bomb. They lambed each other on the head with great, clumsy stone hammers, but their skulls were so hard that the hammers bounced off again. And then the monster who had given the blow would drop his hammer and howl with pain because it had stung his fingers. But he was so stupid that he would do exactly the same thing a minute later. This was a good thing in the long run, for by the end of an hour all the giants were so hurt that they sat down and began to cry. When they sat down, their heads were below the edge of the gorge, so that you saw them no more. But Jill could hear them howling and blubbering and boo-hooing like great babies. 
even after the place was a mile behind. That night they bivouacked on the bare moor, and Puddleglum showed the children how to make the best of their blankets by sleeping back to back. The backs keep each other warm, and you can then have both blankets on top. But it was chilly even so, and the ground was hard and lumpy. The marsh wiggle told them they would feel more comfortable if only they thought how very much colder it would be later on and farther north, but this didn't cheer them up at all. They traveled across Ettensmore for many days, saving the bacon and living chiefly on the moor fowl. They were not, of course, talking birds, which Eustace and the Wiggle which Eustace and the Wiggle shot. Jill rather envied Eustace for being able to shoot. He had learned he had learned it on his voyage with Prince Cas with King Caspian. As there were countless streams on the moor, they were never short of water. Jill thought that when in books people live on what they shoot, it never tells you what a long, smelly, messy job it is plucking and cleaning dead birds, and how cold it makes your fingers. But the great things the great thing was that they met hardly any giants. One giant saw them, but he only roared with laughter and stumped away about on his about his own business. About the tenth day they reached a place where the country changed. They came to the northern edge of the moor and took down a long, steep slope into a different and grimmer land. At the bottom of the slope were cliffs. Beyond these, a country of high mountains, dark precipices, stony valleys, ravines so deep and narrow that one could not see far into them, and rivers that poured out of echoing gorges to plunge sullenly into, sullenly into black depths. Needless to say, it was Puddleglum who pointed out a sprinkling of snow on the more distant slopes. "'But there'll be more on the north side of them, I shouldn't wonder,' he added. It took them some time to reach the foot of the slope, and when they did, they looked down from the top of the cliffs at a river running below from west to east. It was walled in by precipices on the far side as well as, as well as on their own. It was green and sunless, full of rapids and waterfalls. The roar of it shook the earth even when, even where they stood. The bright side of it is, said Puddleglum, that if we break our necks getting down, if we break our necks getting down the cliff, then we're safe from being drowned in the river. What about that? said Scrub suddenly, pointing upstream to their left. Then they all looked and saw the last thing they were expecting, a bridge. And what a bridge, too! It was a huge, single arch that spanned the gorge from cliff-top to cliff-top. And the crown of that arch was as high above the cliff-tops as the Dome of St. Paul's is above the street. Why, it must be a giant's bridge, said Jill. Or a sorcerer's, more likely, said Puddleglum. We've got to look out for enchantments in a place like this. I think it's a trap. I think it'll turn into mist and melt away just when we're out in the middle of it. Oh, for goodness sake, don't be such a wet blanket, said Scrub. Why on earth shouldn't it be a proper bridge? Do you think any of the giants we've seen would have sensed to build a thing like that, said Puddleglum. But mightn't it, mightn't it have been built by other giants, said Jill. I mean by giants who lived a hundred years ago and were far cleverer than the modern kind. It might have been built by the same ones who built the giant city we're looking for. But that would mean we were on the right track, the old bridge leading to the old city. That's a real brainwave pole, said Scrub. It must be that. Come on. So they turned and went to the bridge. And when they reached it, it certainly seemed solid enough. The single stones were as big as those at Stonehenge, and must have been squared by good masons. Once, and must have been squared by good masons once, though now they were cracked and crumbled. The balustrade had apparently been covered with rich carvings, of which some traces remained: mouldering faces and forms of giants, minotaurs, squids, centipedes, and dreadful gods. Puddleglum didn't, still didn't trust it, but he consented to cross it with the children. The climb up to the crown of the arch was long and heavy. In many places the great stones had dropped out, leaving horrible gaps, through which you, through which you looked down on the river, foaming thousands of feet below. They saw an eagle fly through under their feet, and the higher they went, the colder it grew, and the wind blew so that they could hardly keep their footing. It seemed to shake the bridge. When they reached the top and could look down the farther slope of the bridge, they saw what looked like the remains of an ancient giant road stretching away before them into the heart of the mountains. Many stones of its pavement were missing, and there were wide patches of grass between those that remained. And riding towards them on that ancient road were two people of normal grown-up human, grown -up human size. "'Keep on, move towards them,' said Puddleglum. "'Anyone you meet in a place like this is as likely as not to be an enemy, but we mustn't let them think we're afraid.' By the time they had stepped off the end of the bridge onto the grass, the two strangers were quite close. One was a knight in complete armor with his visor down. His armor and his horse were black. 
There were no device on his shield and no banneret on his spear. The other was a lady on a white horse, a horse so lovely that you wanted to kiss its nose and give it a lump, uh, and give it a lump of sugar at once. But the lady who rode side saddle and wore a long, fluttering dress of dazzling green was lovelier still. Good day, t -t -t traveler! She cried out in a voice as sweet as the sweetest bird's song, trilling her r's delightfully. I don't think I trilled them. <laughs> I made her stutter. <laughs> Some of you are young pilgrims to walk this rough waste. <laughs> That's as may be, ma'am," said Puddleglum, very stiffly on his guard. <clears throat> very stiffly and on his guard. We're looking for the ruined city of the giant," said Jill. "The ruined city," said the lady. "That is a strange place to be seeking." "'What will you do if you find it?' "'We've got to,' began Jill, but Puddleglum interrupted. "'Begging your pardon, ma'am, but we don't know you are your friend, a silent chap, isn't he? "'And you don't know us. "'And we'd as soon not talk to strangers about our business, if you don't mind. "'Shall we have a little rain soon, do you think?' "'The lady laughed, the richest, most musical laugh you can imagine. "'Well, children,' she said, "'you have a wise, solemn old guide with you. "'I think none the worse of him for keeping his own counsel, and I'll be free with mine.' But I'll be free with mine. I have often heard the name of the giant, the giantish city Ruinous, and never met any one who would tell me the way thither. This road leads to the burg and castle of Har Harfang, where, where, where dwell the gentle giants. They are as mild, civil, prudent, and courteous as those of Ettensmore are foolish, fierce, savage, and given to all beastliness. And in Harfang you may or may not hear the tidings of the city Ruinous, but certainly you shall find good lodgings and merry hosts. You would be wise to winter there, or at least to tarry certain days for your ease and refreshment. There you shall have steaming baths, steaming baths, soft beds, and bright hearths. And the roast, and the, and the baked, and the sweet, and the strong will be on the table for four, days in a, four times in a day. I say, exclaimed Scrub, that's something like. Think of sleeping in a bed again. Yes, and having a hot bath, said Jill. Do you think they'll ask us to stay? We don't know them, you see. Only tell them, answered the lady, that she of the green kirtle salutes you, salutes them by you, and has sent them two fair southern children for the autumn feast. Oh, thank you, thank you ever so much, said Jill and Scrub. But have a care, said the lady, on whatever day you reach Harfang, that you come not to the door too late, for they shut their gates a few hours after noon, and it is the custom of the castle that they open no open to no one when once they have drawn the bolt. How hard so ev how hard so ever he knock. The children thanked her again with shining eyes, and the lady waved to them. The marsh wiggle took off his steeple hat and bowed very stiffly. Then the silent knight and the lady started walking, started walking their horses up the slope of the bridge with a great clatter of hoofs. Well, said Puddleglum, I'd give a good deal to know where she's coming from and where she's going. Not the sort you expect to meet in the wilds of giant land, is she? Up to no good, I'll be bound. Oh, rot, said Scrub. I thought she was simply super. And think of hot meals and warm rooms. I do hope Harfang, Harfang isn't a long way off. Same here, said Jill. And hadn't she a scrumptious dress? And the horse? All the same, said Puddleglum. I wish we knew a bit more about her. I was going to ask her all about herself, said Jill. But how could I when you wouldn't tell her anything about us? Yes, said Scrub. And why were you so stiff and unpleasant? Didn't you like them? Them, said the Wiggle. Who's them? I only saw one. Didn't you see the knight? said Jill. I saw a suit of armor, said Puddleglum. Why didn't he speak? I expect he was shy, said Jill. Or perhaps he just wants to look at her and listen to her lovely voice. I'm sure I would if I was him. I was wondering, remarked Puddleglum, what you'd really see if you lifted up the visor of that helmet and looked inside. Hang it all, said Scrub. Think of the shape of the armor. What could be inside except a man? How about a skeleton, said the March Wiggle with ghastly cheerfulness. Or perhaps, he added, as an afterthought, nothing at all. I mean, nothing you could see, someone invisible. Really, Puddleglum, said Jill with a shudder, do you, you do have the most horrible ideas. How do you think of them all? Oh, bother his ideas, said Scrub. He's always expecting the worst, and he's always wrong. Let's think about those gentle giants and get on to Harfang as quickly as we can. I wish I knew how far it is. And now they nearly had the first of those quarrels which Puddleglum had foretold. Not that Jill and Scrub hadn't been sparring and snapping at each other a good deal before, but this was the first really serious disagreement. Puddleglum didn't want them to go to Harfang at all. He said that he didn't know what a giant's idea of being gentle might be, and that, anyway, Aslan's signs had said nothing about staying with giants, gentle or otherwise. 
The children, on the other hand, who are sick of wind and rain, and skinny fowl roasted over campfires, and hard, cold earth to sleep on, were absolutely dead set to visit the gentle giants. In the end, Puddleglum agreed to do so, but only on one condition. The others must give an absolute promise that unless he gave them leave, they would not tell the gentle giants that they came from Narnia, or that they were looking for Prince Rillian. And they gave him and they gave him this promise, and went on. After that talk with the lady, things got worse in two different ways. In the first place, the country was much harder. The road led through endless narrow valleys, down which a cruel north wind was always blowing in their faces. There was nothing that could be used for firewood, and there were no nice little hollows to camp in, as there had been on the moor. And the ground was all stony and made your feet sore by day, and every bit of you sore by night. <clears throat> in the second place, whatever the lady had intended by telling them, <clears throat> telling them about Harfang. The actual effect on the children was a bad one. They could think about nothing but beds and baths and hot meals and how lovely it would be to get indoors. They never talked about Aslan, or even about the lost prince now. And Jill gave up her habit of repeating the signs to, over to herself every night and morning. She said this to herself at first, that she was too tired, but she soon forgot all about it. And though you might have expected that the idea of having a good time at Harfang would have made them more cheerful, it really made them more sorry for themselves and more grumpy and snappy with each other and with Puddleglum. At last they came one afternoon to a place where the gorge in which they were traveling widened out and dark fir woods rose on either side. They looked ahead and saw that they had come through the mountains, but before them lay a desolate rocky plain beyond it, further mountains capped with snow, but between them and those further mountains rose a low hill with an irregular, flattish top. "'Look, look!' cried Jill, and pointed across the plain, and there, through the gathering dusk, from beyond the flat hill, everyone saw lights, lights, not moon moonlight or fires, but a homely, cheering row of lighted windows. If you have never been in the wild wilderness day and night for weeks, you will hardly understand how they felt. Harfang cried Scrooge. Harfang cried Scrub and Jill in glad, excited voices, and Harfang repeated Puddleglum in a dull, gloomy voice. But he added, "Hello, wild geese!" and had the, and had the bow off his shoulder in a second. He brought down a, a good fat goose. It was far too late to think of reaching Harfang that day, but they had a hot meal and a fire and started the night warmer than they had been over for over a week. After the, after the fire had gone out, the night grew bitterly cold, and when they woke next morning, their blankets were stiff with frost. Never mind, said Jill, stamping her feet. Hot baths tonight. Have a good day, friends.